Hello everyone, welcome to the Friday edition of The Daily Friend. I'm Nicholas Lorimer, your host, and I'm joined by Gabriel Krauser. How's it? And first time guest on the filmed version of the show, uh, Mr. Nick Babaya. Hello everyone, good to be here. Excellent. Uh, so, everything is terrible. Gabriel, tell us why. <laughs> <laughs> well, we laugh and we laugh, but it's true. Uh, the, I suppose, headline story of the day is that Ramaphosa is in favor of this grand deal where you get to keep ESCOM as an effective ATM machine for patronage and in exchange, your pensions go away. Uh, to give more detail to that, the idea is that the uh, PIC, which manages to, it's the largest investor in the country, 2.2 yep. trillion. Public Investment Corporation, right? Yeah. yeah. So it manages investments mm. uh, and it uh, holds uh, most of the government employee pension fund, the GEPF, uh, most of their money. That's why they've got so much of it. And their fiduciary duty to the pension holders is to invest in long-term secure, asset appreciating, uh, 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 yeah, generate people, a portfolio. Make sure people can retire. A lot of it's defined benefits. So mm. the, you know, the guarantees are uh, laid out when people get the pension of what they're gonna get. And so you need to make sure that you're meeting those obligations. What's the argument for doing this? I think it's important to quickly lay out why anyone would think this is a good idea. One of the reasons is that Edcor was collapsing last year, big retailer in the country, 30,000 jobs or something like that. And its problem was that it owed more money than it had. And when you owe a hell of a lot of money, it's not just paying back the money and the interest on that money. It's also the fact that people start worrying, lenders, potential lenders start worrying about your ability to pay it back at all. And so they charge you a higher interest rate. Then you get debt trap, which is where just paying off the interest rate becomes so expensive. Yeah, that you can't do anything that else. That you can't mm -hmm. do anything. Uh, and, you, and the whole reason the government's, I mean, that the company's gone into trouble is because it, you know, it's doing things wrong, it needs to change things up, and that costs money to do, but you've got no money to do that. So Kasatu stepped up and said, guys, we need to mobilize funds, we need it to get invested here, otherwise we're going to lose a lot of jobs. And there's a sort of fundamental business case to be made. And that was done, 1.2 billion immobilized. And it seems like there's some kind of recovery on the cards. It's not absolutely clear what the midterm outlook really is. Uh, but there's a lot of uh, competitors. Pepco has been performing quite nicely, for example, to make one think that if you find yourself, a big part of the retail market in South Africa is that the sort of middle tier has been withering away. So the upper crust uh, luxury brands mm. still doing pretty well uh, for the connected And the mass cat. mart stuff at the bottom. And the know. stuff at the bottom, mm. uh, it's really sort of... Uh, like Pep. Yeah. like So... Uh, if they can refine themselves in this new market, mm. then that'll be fine. Uh, so one reason to think that it'll work is because something like this has been tried before and it kind of worked. Another th reason to think that this will work is that ESCOM is upstream of pretty much everything else in the economy. Uh, this yeah, podcast, we, we need lights. So uh, we need electricity. What, what was it uh, that someone said that we can't have more than about 1% growth unless we have stable electricity supply? Yeah. Uh, and we don't have more than 1% growth. Yes. Yeah, and we also don't have a stable electricity <laughs> supply. <Yeah. laughs> We've got the worst of both worlds. So, fun fact uh, uh, of history: uh, apartheid uh, had prescribed assets, had the idea of forcing pensioners to invest in its uh, cash cows. Mm. And uh, double fun fact: uh, one of the best cash cows was Escom. And at, at the time, in the, there was there were periods in the eighties where Escom's debt. ESCOM could raise new loans mm. at lower interest rates than the government itself. So ordinarily, the sovereign, the government is the sort of lender of last resort. It's thought to yeah. be the most uh, stable uh, bet uh, on investments because it has the monopoly on, on being able to tax its citizens yeah. and its residents. And, uh, well, what was the thinking? The thinking was there's a revolution coming. It could be a civil war. That could be extremely costly. The government could be taken over by ultra right wingers who want to send people that way, or it could go uh, in a reconciliatory way, but then be overtaken by a socialist communist sort mm -hmm. of satellite state to the USSR, and they might then renege 
on uh, debt, and things, debt yeah, yeah. Uh, do lots of haircuts or just completely write it off as has been done around the world repeatedly. And so people didn't really want to bet on that. But they thought ESCOM, South Africa's have got a big enough economy that it's going to keep demanding electricity and people are going to keep, it's going to keep making a profit. Pay mm-hmm. for that electricity so it'll keep making a profit. So in a sense, because South Africa's uh, got such a big economy and because it's got such a sophisticated economy, the thought is, well, let's make the pensioners pay for it. Uh, but it'll sort of rescue everything else. But, but it's know. history's safest bet. If we can just get ESCOM right, everything else mm. will start working. Mm. ESCOM will make money. They'll get their money back. It'll be fine. But ESCOM is not the creature it once was. Well, and yes and no. I think one of the most damaging reports, uh, and uh, partly due to load shedding and stuff, our internet has been down for the last hour, so I couldn't pull <laughs> up the particular report's name uh, for this podcast. But there was a report issued last year uh, by a private enterprise, uh, which found that ESCOM is not actually really overemployed and it's not really overpaid. The thought that it is overstaffed and overpaid kind of comes from the fact that its staff almost doubled from 2007 and the electricity output remained flat. Yes. So you're paying twice as many people to produce the same amount of electricity and on top of that, wage increases have each and every time been above inflation, I think with the exception of one go in 2010. And uh, so... More people, twice as many people almost, and uh, they're being paid more, uh, but you're still producing the same amount of electricity. On the face of it, that looks like evidence that you're overstaffed and overpaid. Uh, Jabu Mabuza was the chairman of ESCOM's board until he was ousted by Praveen Gordon's faction recently. Mm. And he said ESCOM is at least 33% overstaffed. He also said as politely as he possibly could that to expect anyone to invest in this, uh, he talks about prescribed assets would be crazy and that would be doubly crazy if we're still talking about wage increases above inflation when uh, our productivity is Wait, not what, going up. What, what's the debt of ESCOM now? 450 billion? Roughly 450 Excess. billion rand. Mm. By some estimates, 490. So... What does this report say to counter Jabu Mabuza's claim that ESCOM is overstaffed and overpaid? It says that if you look way back deep into the dark past of apartheid, you will find that in the 1980s, its staff levels are relatively similar to what its staff levels are today. And that there was a massive uh, retrenchment program in the 80s and particularly in the 90s, Hmm. uh, withering it away. And certainly we all know that uh, the undoing of ESCOM's maintenance department and uh, the unfunding of it has been crucial to the collapse to the disaster, of yeah, ESCOM as we know it to today. Mm. So they've got a uh, half a uh, grain of truth there, and with that you can contaminate all of the waters. What's the true story? The other half of the truth is that a lot of the people being retrenched fully needed to go. Yeah. ESCOM was overstaffed. Apartheid was a race nationalist patronage program to uh, create an a glutted and oversized incompetent bureaucracy that would satisfy the voters' desire to have the government play the role of mummy or daddy or ma or pa or baba or mama or whatever you want to call it. Uh, the, Basic- more, the more things change, the more things stay the same. The more they stay the same. <laughs> so the reason ESCOM was rated one of the world's best utilities in the 90s was that the, the redundant staff had been retrenched. For a time, it looked like the good staff had been kept. And in fact, as I'm sometimes reminded by some of our uh, friends in the ANC, some of the early deployments were people with master's degrees in engineering, proven, mm. capable, excellent contributors. There was, a, there was a mix of all of the good things. Black people who'd been kept out of the market, uh, who were in ESCOM and were experienced, were finally allowed to break the glass ceiling. People who were totally outside of ESCOM were allowed to come in. So there was a great talent pool that hadn't been tapped, was now being tapped. The redundant seas were retrenched and uh, we were making technological in- innovations and we were excited about going forward and spreading electricity yeah, more deeply a, throughout the There was the a country. lot of discussion back in those days about uh, the innovations that we were doing in nuclear power um, yep. for ESCOM. Yep. Oh, and when was Ku- where did Kubik Power Station come around? Uh, in the seventies and eighties, I think. Yeah. yeah, and and by and by the two thousands, we're looking at pebble tech, yeah, pebble technologies, technology. because we think that's yeah. a, a more stable, safe, and easy to import way of doing things. Yeah. Also, South Africa carries this sort of bizarre uh, mantle of being the only country to have had a nuclear missile program, a nuclear uh, weapons bomb program, weapons yeah. program, and then, gave it up. and then to give it up. And so we wanted to be at the forefront of until, pebble bed technology because that seemed like a nice way of. Uh, having nuclear power that you can't possibly be masking a nuclear a weapons program, or if you are doing it, it's extremely difficult. Well, South Africa is not the only country that has that uh, distinction. Libya also uh, gave up its weapons before Gaddafi was killed. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
I, I don't think his program was as... It wasn't as advanced, no. Yeah. But it, it okay, so we share that with Libya, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the point is that this report's... I mean, it really doesn't go much further than saying because ESCOM was glutted and overstaffed in, in the apartheid days, but we're not going to look at too many details of how it worked. Mm. Uh, it's glutted and, staffed and overstaffed now. That's fine. So I think that's... Well, when you're 450 billion rand in debt, it's not fine. It's really not fine. The president has guaranteed that there's going to be no wage increases. Uh, sorry, there's going to be no wage freezes. The president has guaranteed there's going to be no retrenchments. His old buddies in Kasatu and in the unions more generally very happy with this. Pravin Gordon, a uh, good, clean communist, very happy with this. Uh, Andre de Reiter, the then one good thing about him coming into... That's the CEO of ESCOM. That's the CEO of ESCOM. The one good thing about him coming into ESCOM is that he had a history of uh, streamlining, rationalizing, and retrenching redundant workers at NAMPAC. Well, he gave that up and said, I'm on board with this too. So the reason this is not like EDCON and the reason uh, that this is not a good idea is that... ESCOM as a, as a good bet, as a good stable safe bet for pensioners and the thought that we need this to work to get the rest of the economy work working. That's all correct so long as you're identifying why we got into the hole in the first place. If the idea is let's pour money in to get us out of the hole, you have to realize that the fact that it's so indebted is a symptom of the root problem. <laughs> it is not itself the root problem. Mm. If there's an alcoholic who now owns a million rand and has lost his job, lost his family, and you say, ah, well, you know what this guy really needs? He needs a million rand. Then I think you haven't begun to address the problem seriously. <laughs> and the problem in ESCOM is not just that it's overstaffed. The problem in ESCOM is also that its procurement deals are, uh, it pays much too well, much for what, diesel, what it pays it, much, much for coal. What was it that you once said that uh, the problem with ESCOM is that there's no one problem? Exactly. Mm. That there's no one. <laughs> so And so now we have Transnet saying it's going to step up and deliver lots more coal. Is it... There are still corrupt co uh, BE deals there. They are still um, overusing this open cycle gas turbine things. They are still having problems with middle management. They are still having problems with old infrastructure. And if you look at the very same report that I've been namelessly citing, we'll maybe drop the actual report's name in the link, it notices that the independent producers that have been hired out by the government are selling electricity to ESCOM at several factors greater the price for generating a single unit of power than what the coal-fired production generates. And part of that is because, generally speaking, the economies of scale haven't worked out. Uh, look at Germany. It's pretty clean, well-run government, but it's uh, renewable got energy generation. Energy, it's got yeah. very, very expensive. It's got the most ex expensive energy in Europe, and that kind of leaves it at the uh, whims of Russia still, a great yeah. gas producer. Uh, also, it's importing nuclear from France, even though it's abandoning its own nuclear program. So, look, smart countries can get this wrong. On top of all of that, we have the problem of a nepotistic, kleptocratic system mm. behind the fig leaf of BEE. Where there's no accountability, where people can just sort of loot stuff and not get punished for yeah. it. Yeah. The, there isn't even a docket open against the Zoom, uh, against the Guptas. The, mm. the, the, the Guptas have ripped this country off to the tune of billions. Mm. I mean, not just in the single digits of billions, tens of billions, perhaps hundreds mm. of billions. And yet we can't make a case against them. Mm. We can't even begin to make a case against them, let alone take mm. them to trial. As long as that is out there, there's no reason for any uh, procurement uh, provider mm. to think that they can't just add 50% onto the cost, hide it in their books, and uh, and know that even if it does become public knowledge, mm. even if they become the sort of uh, persona non grata prima of the nation, they will still be safe. Mm. And safe to keep their assets. So, and we haven't even discussed the design flaws in Kusila and Madupi. And Madupi, this, this, these the, crazy ideas. The two big new power plants, which have had multiple failures of their systems, even though they're very new. Yeah. So right now, it just seems like throwing the keys at the drunk and saying, "Why don't you borrow some more money?" And you know whose money we want you to bot take this time? Gogo, Mama, Dada. Pa, ma, people who have worked their lives mm. through and are looking forward to a retirement that is somewhat more pinched than they might have expected it to be if they paid attention to what was going on in the mid-2000s when this country was growing at 5%, when unemployment was falling, when uh, clean government seemed like not just an idea but a, a, a reality to grow upon and not to wither away. Still, they stand a chance of having a bit of a retirement unless we keep going on with this. And I, I, I will finish with this. Last year... I noticed Ibrahim Patel 
and I noticed that he's the, our the, Minister of Trade and Industry. And I and, and I noticed the Nasdaq convention of the ANC in 2017, where Ramaphosa was elected. Both spoke about uh, well, Ibrahim Patel spoke about investing in real assets, things that are going to ha- are going to make a social benefit, where you're going to benefit from the positive externalities. Like making ESCOM right would be good for every business because mm-hmm. it would grow mm-hmm. the economy. And the ANC explicitly called for investigating prescribed assets, which means not just going after government pension funds, but going after everyone's pension funds in exactly the same way that the Nats did because we just want to do the same movie but change some of the actors, it seems, in this country. I called this out. I wrote about it in Business Day. I spoke about it on ENCA. And I was lambasted by parties inside of big business. For who comparing said, them to the Nats. Is that their... No, no, no. For saying that prescribed assets is anything that the government would possibly entertain as a real idea. Oh, really? Yes. How, long, how long ago was that, may I ask? I think it was about August last year. Mm. Jeez, that's not very long ago. No. And, 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 and the writing was on the wall. I didn't put my finger in the air and discern the breeze. I read the words written by the ANC and listened to the speeches made by its ministers. This is a recurring thing that goes on in our media and our business community. There's just inability to believe that the ANC might actually mean what it says sometimes. Yeah. We're all shocked. That's the one thing we have in common with our president, right? We're <laughs> shocked. Perpetual surprise at how hitting your head against the wall in the same way produces the same outcome. And I, I, I think it's actually built almost on a sort of... Uh, uh, I guess you could call either elitist or racist assumption that the ANC is lying deliberately to the public, to its to its uh, mass of supporters, base, yeah. because that's what it has to do to keep them under control and in its pocket. But it really, what they're going to do is what the sort of big business wants them to do. Right. So there's a chain of the soft bigotry of low expectations. Mm. There's the 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 uh, the belief firstly that the masses desperately desire this. Well, no, it starts with a journalist. I mean, in a way, from a journalist's point of view, I feel like it starts with journalists looking at politicians and being like, we can't expect them to really get it all and really understand mm, it. Mm. And we've got to be very nice to them. Otherwise, we might alienate them. It seems like every journalist's greatest desire is to win the ear of the president. And they think they'd lose that ear if they said something critical or if they said it mm. too soon. So they give a lot of slack and a lot of rope. And then the politicians think that the people wouldn't really understand the argument that yes, we have very high unemployment and yes, we're adding to that unemployment by retrenching people, but that's because the only way that an economy works is if you reward value add rather than reward sit on your hands. Mm. And in the long run, if we retrench a little, a few people now, we'll make ESCOM a going concern. Everyone will want to invest in it uh, if it's a if it's a genuinely viable prospect. No what no. If you have a good idea, if it's a really good business idea, you don't have to take a gun to investors' heads and say, look, we're going to fine you, jail you, or, or, or if you. Don't you. Invest if you in don't us, invest no. in us, you just say, here's the brilliant idea. Yes. I, I remember when Ramaphosa came out, there was absolute euphoria in the media and the way people were reacting. And I was just thinking to myself, oh, boiling frog is working. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, my sense is when, 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 he won it, when Ramaphosa won at Nazarick, I ululated with joy because I thought that he was a reformer and also because I looked at uh, Mark Data's polling, which had it that uh, he was six or eight times more popular than Nkosazana Laminizuma within the ANC's base, mm. and that the ANC's base, to a similar proportion, preferred business-friendly or keep it the same policies to radical economic mm. transformation. And I thought that Ramaphosa understood that. I thought that Ramaphosa understood that he was beloved because people thought you were a man of independent wealth, so you don't need to loot, and you also have the noose to understand how business works and that you can't spend more than you make and that sometimes you have to retrench people. And Ramaphosa does send the right kind of signals on his own farm. He's retrenched a few people, but he can't retrench people at ESCOM. Uh, And I think that kind of speaks to the hypocrisy that you're talking about. It's sort of, he seems seems to believe that the, the people of South Africa wouldn't get it if he said, look, we do have high unemployment and we have to make it worse. We have to retrench 10,000 people. But here's why, it's because business has to be value add oriented. All of ESCOM needs to be collecting the money that's outstanding to it, generating power for less than it's selling it for in order to be making a bit of a profit. And that profit then goes into paying back the debt and also supporting the fiscus, which has been bailing it out repeatedly over the last several years. And that support of the fiscus then translates into uh, more money going to education, health, social grants, and so on. That is a simple enough argument for most South Africans to get, but I don't think that the powers that be trust most South Africans to get it. And, and the, 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 the shock, you know, the great shock is that if you don't talk about an idea in public, you can't build public support for it. 
So people get sort of surprised when, what you, why is there so much political pressure to do the completely insane thing um, when no one has been defending publicly the clever thing to do? Yeah. And I want to say one last thing about that, not talking about it and the sort of uh, connection to, 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 to the broader history of the last few years. Uh, I just want to reiterate the thought that in 2017, that was the year of the new dawn. But the meme only came about in 2018. 2018 was the year that it became clear it is a false dawn. The JSC uh, did not do well. Foreign investment outside of a few uh, sort of uh, heads of state, the Qataris, the Chinese making some promises. Uh, there was no voluntary investment being made on transparent business terms. Uh, and uh, the idea that there's a false dawn, that meme only hit in 2019. The reality of 2019 was the red dawn. In 2019, the government started talking up prescribed assets. In 2019, it made it perfectly clear that it is going forward with expropriation without compensation, that it is going to drag a steak knife across the Bill of Rights, across the property rights of this country that keep its economy going. That is only dawning on us now. It's on the headlines and it's not being called by its name. But what Ramaphosa has done is has identified, I think, three factions in the ANC. The race nationalist looters. There's now an arrest warrant out for one of them. That is not the side that Ramaphosa has chosen to go with. He has toasted champagne with uh, Zuma in the build-up to the 2019 election, but he seems to be leaving him out to dry. And I think the message is quietly that if you don't come in line, you might be next. It could take a very long time, but eventually we might get to you. The second function are the honest communists. They are the red dawners. They are the guys who think this is a brilliant idea. Getting pensioners to bail out ESCOM is going to really work especially if you don't retrench anyone, because everyone wins, yeah, we just and need never to mind the future. The future is utopia, just give us long they, Yeah, they believe that we just need to unlock all of that supposedly hidden and stashed away capital. That's hoarding, been, hoarding wealth. Yeah, that's been hoarded. Yeah. And that once we have those resources, we'll be able to fix everything. Ram, Ramaphosa seems to have gone with them. He seems to have thought, well, you know, Tabo Mbeki didn't really go with them. He ultimately rejected the basic income grant. Uh, Mandela didn't go with them. He went to Davos to say that we want property rights, that we're not going to nationalize the banks, the land or the mines. Uh, Jacob Zuma didn't go with them. He kind of sat back and allowed race nationalist looters to get away with murder, in some cases literally, and, uh, and with uh, ripping off South Africa of at least a third of its GDP directly. So let me try something new. The ANC needs to try something new in order to keep the imagination of the people alive and in order to give our sort of uh, cheerleaders in the media something to cheer about. Yes. And the grand fashion in uh, the West that we look to so fondly is of ultra-left socialism. In other countries, they're doing it where they have still got some money to <laughs> some of other people's money to run out of. Mm. Right now, we've already run out of other people's money, so it's a particularly bad idea. <laughs> but we're going to try it anyway. And the third faction of the ANC, the genuine reformers, the Kachlema Motlantes, the Trevor Manuels, where are they? You know, I think there's also another um, angle from which we can look at this, and uh, it's quite clear, I think, from Gabriel's uh, information that he's given us, is that there's no way that throwing money at this is going to work. And I think the case in point of that is SAA. I don't know how many billions and billions of rand have been thrown at this airline, but it's very clear that just the sort of structures within uh, some of these SOEs are such that they are almost unsavable. They're sort of being put on life support just by throwing more and more money, so to speak. But I think that there's an interesting thing to examine when you look at South Africa's budget, and that's the perspective I view this from, these prescribed assets. Uh, South Africa's got debt, jet, um, <laughs> debt to GDP uh, uh, ratios of a developed, very successful first world country. And we are not that. Certainly, we're one of the more developed countries in Africa, but our debt to GDP, uh, GDP ratios are alarmingly high. And it's quite interesting that they've gotten to that point, considering that, you know, just a decade ago or a little bit further than that, we actually were growing quite well. And a little bit before that, the ANC government, I think it was in the late 90s or early 2000s, uh, managed to get a budget surplus. Which uh, what, what year yeah. was that? Uh, that's uh, right. Mid two thousand. Mid two thousand. Mm, yeah. So so you know, uh, Davi Ruet, a fantastic economist, laid this out: how governments, in their quest for more and more money, go after their citizens' uh, resources, and this starts off basically with taxation. 
And this is getting exhausted, I think, in South Africa. Because yeah, we've I, hit the Laffer curve. You can't we, 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 We've hit the Laffer curve, but more, uh, moreover, uh, a, a huge amount of our revenue is coming from a very, very small population. I think just 600,000 people. Um, I might be wrong on that number, but we, we are getting smaller and smaller in terms of the number of people who are providing the overwhelming majority of tax revenue for this country. Yeah, and income tax can't even pay for the government's wage bill. Yeah, exactly. So so this is becoming totally and utterly unsustainable. So after tax taxation is sort of used up, the next thing that they go after are the savers. Yeah. Because I, I, you often hear lefties sort of use this term wealth hoarders, like Elon Musk, because he's so rich, is a wealth hoarder. Like as if his entire net worth is like uh, pieces of gold screwed up, uh, stored up like Scrooge McDuck. In a swimming pool for in him to swim around yeah, and not invested around. in fact in a business. It's, it's, yeah. and, and it's literally punishing people for acting responsibly with their own money. Yeah, and, so, and this is one of the things that uh, the IRR really awakened me to because when I first came to work here, I was sent out for quite a while into the rural heartland, KZN, Northwest and Pumalanga. And what I found, is, particularly in, in KZN, was the word Zonda that uh, a kind of jealousy or envy or hatred. Mm. If someone did slightly better than their neighbor, a zonda would be put on them and they would be undone of that uh, slight benefit that they'd managed to win for themselves. And if some farmer had donated to his former employees, uh, I mean, literally there was a, a farmer who donated a, a Jojo tank to them. He'd helped them resettle on new land and he wanted them to have two Jojo tanks so that they could have one for uh, personal use and one for, to sort of support their gardens. And they had a couple of hectares of land that was big enough to r run a few cattle and, and do quite a lot of veg in a good veg area. The thing was uh, slashed by a panga knife. Then a new one was put up, that was stolen. Then a new one was put up by the government, that was uh, uh, stolen too. Then they put one up that they bolted down so it was like impossible <laughs> to steal. They like screwed, heavy duty, long, the very things expensive we have to do in this country. <laughs> <laughs> and then that's when they just took a panga and slashed the Jojo tank through. Pure spite. Was that in case? Spite is the English mm. word I think for Zonda. Mm. Mm. There's a spiteful value adders. There's a spiteful attitude towards those who have found other people's problems and been like, "I'm going to solve your problem in exchange. Give me some money." That's called business. We feel spite towards those people mm. and our, our our pundits, our politicians, those who should stand up and say, you know, it's actually worth defending the hard workers. Mm. It's worth defending the, the uh, entrepreneurs and, the, and those who take really uh, bold risks to try and help solve other people's problems. They know where to be seen unless you go to the cigar lounges and the cocktail bars where they swan around with elite politicians and share jokes about how the lumpen proletariat doesn't quite understand the program that we're on. But soon they'll see the glorious, divine, socialist utopia brought upon us as was done in Sweden or some other country with which we bear very, very little resemblance mm. in terms of accountability of and in terms of actual stored wealth. For, for me, one of the most uh, depressing versions of that was I was reading a news article a few years ago about uh, someone in Limpopo who, who had participated in killing someone who was accused of being a witch. Hmm. Uh, and the sort of answer they gave was, no, I know that person. The reason they must have been a witch is because I know them. There's no way they could have gotten a job without witchcraft. Hmm. And it was just well, what do you, what spite. Do you say it was to that kind of... There's very little you can do in, in terms of arguing against that kind of reasoning. Well, you can you can you can lift up and praise people who don't you know who 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 who, no. who are builders. And that's yeah. actually something, if I might mention, that I found excellent about China is that the very the richest people in China, and there's two in particular, guy uh, uh, Ma Yun, uh, Jack Ma, he's the head of Alibaba Group, mm. and uh, Ma Huatang is the head of Tencent. Those two guys are like put on pedestals, and the, even in the, mm. you know all the media in China's government run. Right? These uh, people aspire to be like these people. Mm. They're like people's mm. role models. Gab By comparison, Gabriel's, Gabriel's also talked a lot about how South Korea had a program of doing that sort of state-sanctioned yeah. praising of people who were successful entrepreneurs really? and yeah. builders. Yeah, they'd go around and they'd give you give a little village some concrete and some steel, and they say, "Let's see what you do with it in a year. If you do something really good, they'll give you more. They'll ask you what you want. If you don't do anything, they leave you be." And so people start getting mm. a material sense to back up the, the, the sense of admiration that goes with Vading Ali or not. And to compare your story about Jack Ma, here, Richard Maponya 
is one of the great capitalists yeah, exactly. of South Africa. Mm -hmm. One of the great value adders. He found a problem. The problem is supermarkets weren't in the townships and spaza shops didn't have the economies of scale to make it work. He introduces, he starts very low selling, I think, chicken eggs and stuff like that. He builds himself up to a position where he can solve the problem by developing more than retail services. He hates BEE. He speaks out against BEE. In, uh, he writes an article for the Free Market Foundation. When he dies, everyone eulalates, everyone celebrates him, but does anyone mention the man's actual ideas? No. Is there any respect for the actual person? And He's transformed into a puppet, and then a puppet show is presented at his funeral, which is so embarrassing it's hard to even talk about it, where our police can't turn in unison four people in a row. And oddly enough, one of his biggest praises was actually Herman Mashaba, which makes total sense because Herman Mashaba was also a, a businessman who was very successful under the apartheid years. But something has happened between that guy writing the book Capitalist Crusader and now, in which his opinion on things like BE have just turned 180 well, degrees. Well, and then they've turned back. Let's see where he goes. Well, Let's see where he goes. But, but certainly I, I, the, the, the major forces an are... An unmoored ship uh, yeah. feels like... I'd, I'd like to just continue uh, just about the, the prescribed assets because I think it's very important to realize one thing, that eventually... Even if this does go through, that's not going to be infinite. Eventually, they are, people are also going to run out of money mm. when the government starts going for the people who save, the, the, the vanishingly small population who, who do. They're going to start moving their resources overseas, as uh, we advise here, actually, um, you know, in the face of uncertainty. And then eventually, there's only going to be one option left because the country is going to have massive debt. Uh, its budget is, is not going to be met by the tax revenue. And unfortunately, that last uh, thing to do is just to print more money. Yeah. Our and good old friend hyperinflation. Right, and that's going to, and hyperinflation, uh, you know, I think it was uh, economist Russell Lamberti, I don't want to misquote him, so I apologize to, to Russell if I'm saying this wrong, but he, uh, an economist made uh, an analogy the other day to like, would you rather have an atomic bomb dropped on your country or would you rather have hyperinflation? It sounds like a horrible comparison, but the whole thing is that if you, if you have a bomb dropped on your country, at least you can recover from that after a while. Zimbabwe, I challenge any person to go to Zimbabwe and actually check out the state of that place. It's unbelievable. It's nothing close to any of the surrounding African countries here in Southern Africa. It is so much worse off. Um, and hyperinflation would just absolutely decimate this country. Mm. I don't know how we could get back short of a very, very robust return. And if you decimate this country, you do really... Bad bit of damage to the region. Yeah, One of the reasons yeah. Zimbabwe survives is foreign aid in the form of food flowing in. Another reason mm. is that immigrants could come here and, mm. and find jobs. And, and just remember here that when these sorts of economic disasters happen to countries like South Africa, where we've got a middle income population, high income population, and then a lot of people sort of at the lower end of the spectrum unemployed making their way up, China, yeah. people who can afford a plane ticket will buy a plane ticket and go somewhere else. And those who can't afford a plane ticket will be stuck here. And Zimbabwe, you know, I think one of the tragic things is there was like this huge backlog log in just getting a passport. You know, some people can't even get a passport to leave. So it's, it's incredibly sad uh, if, if we were to go down that route. But people have to realize that this thing about prescribed assets, I think, is ultimately the next step down that route. Yeah, and so I think well, it's that's, we that, that, and that and the corrosion of property rights, which allows right, exactly. the discretion mm -hmm. over what a property is valued at to go to a municipal head, uh, of a branch and say, you know, well, we've run out of money. Our, our municipalities are hugely indebted, partly because they haven't paid their money to ESCOM because there's no one problem at ESCOM. So we're going to take your holiday home. Yeah, let's take your holiday home. We'll sell that we'll off. We'll take your farm. You don't need that house in Neisner. Why not? It is predictable. It, and maybe this whole area of bond houses would be a really good place for a shopping mall. Yeah, yeah. And you can sell that off to, oh God. No, it's just, it's, it's very, it's so very, it's very, the, the red dawn is here. And the faster that South Africans wake up to the fact that honest communists are not the solution mm -hmm. and that being surprised every time that, this, that adding to the poison doesn't make you healthier, <laughs> the, 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 the better chance we stand of getting out of this relatively unscathed. Damage has been done. There are scars that have been impressed on this country in the last three years that are not going to heal for years. But rather than lay down more scars, uh, you know, we can... And very soon we will not be able to be shocked because there will be no electricity. <laughs> so we've talked a bit about the problem, um, but uh, Nick, tell us about what at least we at the IRR are doing to sort of stem the tide a bit. Yes, look, I mean, there's we've gone through various problems and sometimes it just seems like a tsunami of things going wrong. 
But uh, here at the campaigns of the IRR, I think we're embarking on a very important campaign. And one thing I think a lot of people may be very naive to, which I have only recently found out of my time working here, is how spineless some of the big corporations are in this country mm. are. Now, we mentioned it about journalists early on, but really that same mentality goes, I think, for most businesses in the country mm. with a, a couple of minor exceptions. Now, you know, all of these policies that we have been mentioning are going to be absolutely disastrous for businesses. So you would think that these people would step up and actually uh, use their voices to speak out against it. I think in some other countries, they're a little bit more vocal, but, but one, Africa, one does also find, though, that a suspiciously large number, especially in very big companies of, yeah. uh, of executives, have either some money overseas or a way of getting overseas. Well, this is part of the reason mm. why perhaps they're not nearly as invested as the people who don't, who have got who the only money that they have is denominated in rands. Mm. Uh, so <laughs> I think that's part of the reason. But, uh, you know, there was a very interesting quote. I think this sums up really what our campaign is about by the CEO of NetBank. Now, you'd think if you were a bank, Yes, man, you, you would be very, very much against EWC. You'd be speaking out against it from the rooftops. And um, what's his name? Mike Brown, the CEO of NetBank, was on an SABC interview. And the guy was asking him, so what would the implications be if EWC happened in South Africa? What about people who have a bond on a house and then that property gets expropriated? Will they still have to pay it off? Blah, 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 blah. There's obviously various problems. And he sort of very timidly and furtively said that, yes, no, uh, of course, you know, if expropriation without compensation goes through, uh, that'll be terrible. We're not in favor of that. And that'll uh, cause, in his words, a classical banking crisis. I don't quite know what he means by that, but I'm sure we can imagine. But we're very uh, supportive of the whole process. And we think South Africa needs to go through with this. And it's like the analogy I always gave is, you know, if you were a, a, a turkey and somebody said to you, what's your opinion on Thanksgiving? We're in thinking of introducing Thanksgiving to South Africa. It's an American holiday, but we're going to introduce it here. And, and you as a turkey said, well, look, I mean, I'm very much against Thanksgiving, quite frankly, because it means that I would die. But I'm very happy that South Africa is talking about this issue. I think it's very important <laughs> that we talk about whether or not we want Thanksgiving. Uh, obviously, if it does happen, we'll all die, and that'll be bad. But it, it's good that we go through this process. Mm, mm. So there's a lot of... And, and that's it's, it's, it's worth mentioning that Nedbank has been one of the more... Uh, aggressive banks compared to some of the others in talking down EWC. I yeah, mean, this yeah, is the high standard. Just saying we, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, he, at least he said that it would cause a the, banking yes, crisis. The fact <laughs> that he even said that is actually, I mean, I've been Googling and, and trying to do research to find anything banks have said against EWC. And it, it, like that was one of the few comments I found. So and, right? so, and so, and, and, and I think another way of thinking about that problem is game theoretically, right? So here's a situation, there's five people. If one of them puts their head above the parapet, then they can be overwhelmed and their head can be chopped off. Yeah. And that'll be the end of that person. So you don't want to speak up, you don't want to put your head up, you don't want to say anything. If two did it, it'd be a little bit harder. Maybe their heads would be chopped off, maybe not. If all five did it, there's only like two dudes on the other side, all five would be able to overwhelm them or at least to make the analogy more precise, all five together would stand a much better chance of, the two. of putting their heads up and not having their heads mm. chopped off and in fact making a persuasive argument. So there's this thing. So what game theory says is that if you want to evaluate what the best route for you to take is, you have to think about what those around you are going to do. And if everyone around you is going to be a coward, it's going to become prudent or much more rational to be a coward yourself. Mm. And this creates a sort of bind, a perverse reinforcing cycle where someone, 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 a bunch of actors act as cowards. And then that makes it for people who kind of might otherwise be courageous, incentivizes them to be cowards too. I think that the, 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 the inverse of that, the tipping point idea, is that if you can cross a certain threshold of one or two or three or four organizations, the IRR, uh, political parties, some big business, some big captains of interest industry. If you can just start breaking away, you can find that one more hit at the damn wall and the whole thing opens and everyone puts up their hand and everyone puts up their head and says, let's not do it. And this has happened in 2017. Zuma must fall. It took a long time before big business spoke out against Zuma. It took a long time before uh, journalists spoke out against Zuma. The, they were the early harbingers, the DA, stop corruption, stop Zuma. They were accused of being racist uh, Back by in 2009, yes. ongoing celebrity editors. Uh, but 
be that as it may, eventually everyone came to the party and eventually uh, there were people in the streets, tens of thousands marching to say Zuma must fall. The same thing can happen again. Also the downfall of apartheid, as Franz Krenner always likes to remind us, took many people by surprise, as it were. Many people were shocked, as it were. Many people thought that it's going to continue going this way forever mm. and there's no ways you can change it. So even if you don't like the racism, just shut up about it and, and, and bait fuss. Didn't work out that way. Because mm-hmm. people made their voices heard. Mm-hmm. Because one, then two, then ten, then a million people made their voices heard. Lifted above the parapet and changed the game theoretic equation completely to where the other side then starts uh, retreating and, and going into the quarter and making so, concessions. So this is exactly actually what the IRR's campaign is kind of looking to do. Uh, so what we've been doing is we've been writing open letters to uh, many big companies and asking them specifically to state where they stand on various form on on various aspects of EWC, so to the banks uh, and people who lend money for mortgages, we said, you know, who who will will people have to pay back their uh, mortgages if their property is expropriated? Um, Such a simple question, a generally, very simple question. Not many answers, by the way. Yeah. But from everything that we have seen of the small answers, the answer has generally been yes, you will still have to pay back. So in other words, the position that most of the banks seem to be taking is that if your house or your farm or your whatever is expropriated, you will lose the property and still owe the money to the bank. I mean, that is almost a joke. That is almost the most funny joke I've ever heard. And the alternative, however, but from the bank's perspective, the alternative is that they will have all of that debt the, of, of the properties, of the money they've lent out to, to buy properties, um, will be reduced to effectively zero then uh, if they don't try and make you pay it back. So they would face collapse. And the thing about banks is that they're all leveraged. If they've got $100 million in loans that outstanding that they're collecting on, uh, on, their, on their balance sheet, that means they've lent out a billion. Hmm. So if they only lose f- half... Of their a- of if only half those assets go toxic, or only five percent of those assets go toxic, it can cause a cascading effect. It can cause a run on the banks. People want to withdraw. They're worried this one's being particularly affected. The land banks also recently been junked. How you know? Uh, how how we how we insulate ourselves from that? We've also written, I believe, to insurance companies. Uh, yes, let me let me talk about that briefly, mm. and I'll just say to any of the viewers here, perhaps this is something you can do on your own. So we've written a few letters to some of the biggest insurance companies in South Africa, and we've asked a simple question uh, regarding what's going to happen to your clients if their property is stolen by the government, because that's what it is. You know, if you think about it, if my car gets stolen, that's like one of the things which I might in, insure myself against. Uh, the government is going to do the same to us now. So have insurance companies created any sort of uh, policies regarding EWC and do they intend to? And what I'd encourage the listeners here, and I'm sure most people listening to this have got some kind of insurance for something, send an email or make a phone call and ask your insurance, if my house, car, bicycle, uh, wedding ring, uh, it doesn't. you can get insured for all, all these kinds of things I've been seeing in my research, is expropriated, after uh, the constitution has changed and the expropriation bill comes into effect, what's going to happen? Have you got any policies for me? What is your reaction going to be? And what I'd love to hear actually is just you know some kind of higher up in these uh, uh, companies saying, this is bad for the country. We think we are against EWC, but as usual, people have about the same spine as a jellyfish. Yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll say one exception because there are exceptions. Yes. Paul Jackson, CEO of Tough, the most fascinating financial institution in this country to me because it is the biggest bank of CBD redevelopment. It moved in in the 2000s when no one else wanted to touch those uh, assets, largely because of rent boycotts, land invasions, a breakdown in the, in the rule of law, uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and promises by the government to, ensure, to protect people against this that were broken. Uh, town was in a shambles. And it was very sad because there are lots of good people who were trying to make good lives for themselves there and just needed a little extra money to improve this part of the building or, or just put a fingerprint security thing so that uh, working class blue collar families could move in there and be closer to work and send their kids to a school and stuff like that. Tough moved in. Tough said, we'll take the risk because we're not afraid of going into a place that's full of poor black people. We, th- we see value adders. We see potential heroes of this economy. And we want to fund them and we're going to pick them apart. We're going to pick winners from losers by, by, by looking at the jockeys, by looking at the characters of the people that want to bet, by looking at the game plans, by looking at how they think they're going to make a building work. 
and we're going to find value add propositions and we're going to fund those value add propositions. And you know what? Because of our work, we're also going to get a bit of a profit out of that. And Tuff has done extremely well. And if you drive around the CBD of Joburg, Pretoria, Durban, you will see buildings that used to be wrecks where there were fires inside, where people were being harassed by those who uh, effectively hijacked the building, saying, you have to pay us rent. We're not going to give you water. We're not going to get electricity. This building we don't own. But if you don't pay us rent, then we're going to boot you out or worse. Those, that's where the money was going and everything was going down. Some of those buildings now beautiful, safe, simple, effective dwellings. Paul Jackson said to me, you cannot make a financial product that manages the risk of uncertainty about property rights themselves. There is no such thing as managing that risk because you've moved completely outside of the realm of a rules-based, quantitative-based mm. system into the realm of discretion. Mm. You just, yeah. the risk that you're then betting on is what's going inside of the mind of some one here or someone some there. Some low-ranking official in a municipality somewhere, some... And that is just, you mm. can't insure against that, you can't finance that, you can't find a risk premium to calculate what kind of interest rate you'd have to charge against a loan like that. There is, I, it's just hard to imagine, I mean, I can think of one other bank, the latest entrance to the big banks, that has a similar claim to, to, to really boosting competitiveness in this country's financial sector. And, but sh you know, short of that, TUF is really a hero organization. It's a heroic organization. And, and it's, in a way, it's surprising. In a way, it's not surprising at all that that's the place where you hear spirited defense of, of the rule of law and of the necessity for people, the poorest, hardworking people, to not be shanked by discretionary uh, return Arbitrary to the abuse. medieval mm. way of doing things where mm. the king just sort of decides, well, I like you, I don't like you, so you get to keep your stuff. You told a very funny mm. joke. Court jesters used to get property from the state for being funny. That's how it used to work. And people who told the wrong kind of joke would have their property expropriated at sort of 30% compensation. And their head too. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we can't afford to go back there. We've just come too far forward to give it up. And so it is important. SMS, email your insurance company, ask your bank, ask your neighbor. If And you know, we at the IRR really are supportive of people who are making bets outside of the country. It's not a problem if you are worried about all of this and so you're trying to buy some gold or buy some dollars. That's fine. But if you, if you don't also bet a little bit on this country with your voice by just saying, mm. we can't afford this, then I think you're letting yourself down. And you can also support us if you want to uh, use us as an instrument to, to, to make your voice heard. Um, you can SMS your name to 32823. Uh, we'll call you back um, and sign you up as a friend of the Institute to help uh, fund our activities here, our campaigns like this, where we put pressure on corporates, where we put pressure on government, where we put pressure on political parties in order to see some actual change to policy that uh, can hopefully protect our rights. Um, so, gentlemen, I think we're going to call it there. Uh, thank you very much for watching, and we'll catch you on the Monday edition of The Daily Friend.